hopefully you watch the um, two videos I sent for whatever day that was, Monday. So today I'm not going to go over literary terms, techniques, that kind of stuff at all. I'm just going to start going through the poems that we have uh, to finish up the course on the syllabus. So we're going to begin on page 645. <clears throat> I'm going to try and get through, try to get through uh, several poems today. The first two <clears throat> by Herrick and Marvell, uh, Robert Herrick, Andrew Marvell. The first two are carpe diem poems. Carpe diem's Latin phrase just means seize the day. <clears throat> And what that implies is live for now because you don't know when you're going to die. You, you might die tomorrow, so get what you can now. And usually in their more Latin context, um, it's about enjoying yourself as much as you can while you're young. Because once you get old, you get ugly, and you're no longer sexually desirable, and you're not going to get any at that point in life. Okay. So this first poem we're going to read by Robert Herrick, written in 1648, to the virgins to make much of time. Herrick, uh, just very brief background, Herrick was an Anglican priest, um, and he wrote, in, in his poetry, he wrote about everything. He wrote about sex, he wrote about love, he wrote about dying and death, he wrote about marriages, baptisms. He wrote about partying, everything. Um, <clears throat> so it's a pretty wide, pretty wide range. He writes about the joys of liquor. Um, he has a poem called "Farewell to Sack." Sack is a kind. Of, it's a very cheap wine. It's like the wine you buy today, about a gallon, you know. Um, and it's you know. The speaker in that is saying, I've got to give you up because I'm not getting anything done while I'm under your spell. So this one, to the virgins to make much of time. Now one thing you got to do with poetry, and, and bear in mind, reading poetry is like listening to music, listening to songs. That's all poetry is. It's just songs, essentially, in written form in front of you. So one of the things you, you need to do is you've got to pay attention to the individual words. You have to pay attention to how the words are arranged within clauses, within sentences, within stanzas, etc., to understand how they mean what they mean, or to understand what the poet is trying to get across. Now, look at this one and just look at the title, To the Virgins, To Make Much of Time. Is virgins a quote-unquote, gendered term. No, it's not. It refers to anyone who has never had sex. Okay? That's all it is. To the virgins, comma, to make much of time. Notice, it's not to a single person. The next poem we're going to read is to his coy mistress. All right? So it's the speaker, his, him, speaking to his mistress, girlfriend, whatever. All right? This one, to the virgins, to make much of time. And make much of time means to use it. Use your time, okay? So it's four stanzas, I believe. Yep, four stanzas, quatrains. They have a rhyme scheme to them. We're not going to pay much attention to that. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow is still a-dying. So, the emphasis is on time. Time is leaving us. And the image in the poem is flowers, rosebuds. Why does it say, gather ye rosebuds while ye may, time is still flying. This same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Rosebuds, those are tightly bound roses. The petals haven't unfolded. The speaker is saying, first line, get these new buds that haven't opened today. Why? Because tomorrow they'll already be dying. 
The implication is within that short 24 hour span, they're gonna open up and the petals will start to drop. Passage of time goes quickly, okay? Stanza two. So the first image, a dying rosebud. Stanza two. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a getting, the sooner will his race be run, and nearer he's to setting. So, east, west, the sun rises. When it reaches the PM, prime meridian, that's what PM stands for, so everything after 12 noon is PM. When it reaches here, for all intents and purposes, what has it already done at that point? It's it, man. It's over. So what is this within the context of the stanza? Well, this is middle age, or more specifically, your midlife point. Okay? I am well beyond my midlife point. You guys have your midlife point well ahead of you, assuming you all live to a natural age and you die in your 70s, 80s, 90s maybe, all right? There's a biblical idea, and poets love to play on this, that the middle point of our lives is between 35 and 40. Because the Old Testament says three score years and 10 is what is allotted to man, that's 70 years, or at most four score, this is in the Psalms, 80 years. So. 35 to 40. What's that mean? You're rising here, you reach 35 or 40, and for the most part, your life is beyond you. It's, you're beyond the best part of your lives. That age is best, which is the first, when youth and blood are warmer. But being spent the worst and worst times still succeed the former. What's the age that is first? It's this part. It's not when you're one year old, or two, or five, or 10. It's when you're in your quote unquote prime. Generally speaking, 22 to about 30 to 35, okay? When youth and blood are warmer, there is a medieval and Renaissance idea that when you are young, when you're in your up to your early 30s, your blood is like the water in this bottle. It's very fluid, it moves around just fine, okay? But the idea was the older and older you got, the less fluid your blood became and the more congealed or hard. So replace the water that's in this with freshly baked bacon grease, just out of the skillet. I could do this and it would slosh around. If I sat it here and kept talking for the next 45 minutes, by the end of that 45 minutes, I could do this, I could take the lid off and do this and what would happen? Nothing. That grease would not pour out. Why? Because according to the belief at the time, that's what happens to our blood. So compared to you, your blood's like this, my blood would be like that congealed grease. I'm getting closer to dying. Being spent, that is, when youth and blood are spent, the worst and worst times still succeed the former. For you guys, because you're still on this side of the trajectory, the implication is every day is better than the day before. They just get better and better and better until you reach this point. Once you reach that point, every day is worse than the day before. So for me, today will be worse than yesterday, and tomorrow will be worse than today, and the day after that will be, get the idea? Then. Then is like therefore. In summation, be not coy but use your time, and while you may, go marry. So, don't be coy. What does the word coy mean? We don't use it anymore. It's, it's literally 
almost never used for the past 50 years, at least, all right? It's generally only used about one sex, women. And what it alludes to, what it connotes is playing a little hard to get. And everybody knows whether you want to admit it or not. This is the truth. When men and women, I'm going to speak about heterosexual couples, when men and women like each other, what happens? Is it just jump in the sack? Sometimes, not usually. It's, there's a game to be played. The man does something, the woman does something. It's like a dance, okay? And each one has their side, their part to play. Traditionally, I'm gonna say before 75 years ago, traditionally, okay, the woman's part was not to be the initiator. The woman's part was to see what the man does and then respond in some way. And usually, let's go back even a few, couple of hundred years farther, and usually that response was to indicate some interest, but not too much interest, okay? So to make him do what? Do more. So use a different metaphor, use a fishing metaphor. Who's got the hook and bait? She does, the fisher, she does. She's got him on the hook and what? Reel him in a little bit and then when he gets too close, too amorous, let's say, too touchy, let that line out a little bit, okay? That's being coy. It's playing hard to get. Be not coy, the speaker says. Use your time. While you may, go marry. What, what's the use your time and while you may, go marry? Go marry means go get married. When is the time the speaker is suggesting to get married. When you're young, when you're hot, <laughs> okay? Male or female. Why? For having lost but once your prime. What's your prime? That's your first age. It's your early, your youth. Once you lose that, you may forever tarry. What does tarry mean? Wait. You can wait forever if you've lost this, your prime. All the images for the person in their prime are describing what? Youth, beauty, desirability, ultimately sex. Sexual, uh, what's the phrase I want? Desirability. Look at it this way. Men. Who would you rather marry? A beautiful young woman in her, assuming you're straight, beautiful young woman in her early mid-twenties or something like that, or a 70-year-old? Wrinkly. Droopy, hair falling out, gray. Most are going to go with the former. That's the point. Why? Because if you don't use it, <laughs> you'll never use it. That's the whole idea behind Carpathian and Palms. In one sense, they're rather disgusting. Because, I mean, they tend to generally all be about sex. Now, the next poem, I'm going to warn you right now. It has an image in it that is absolutely vile. I mean, just disgusting. I was thinking of one of my students in my class yesterday. I've got a class with 19 students, four showed up. One of them, the sole woman in the class. And I, I got a bit graphic talking about this one passage. I probably will today too, just to give you all the benefit of the image. Um, but it's, it's not pretty, okay? so. The next poem, to his coy mistress. 
Andrew Marvell. Another 17th century, okay? But let me back up for a second. So the to the virgins to make much of time. Who's it addressed to? General virgins, male and female? No, because of that word coy. That word coy was never used, especially in the 17th century, for men. It was only referencing women. To his coy mistress. That's pretty clear. The speaker, the persona of the poem, is male. He's speaking to his mistress. We think the word mistress means the person you're sleeping with. Unmarried person you're sleeping with. It's not what it means at all. It means the woman who has kind of control over you. Like master, mistress. Okay? <clears throat> not physical, not property-wise, not that kind of control. But through her charms, she's got control of you, so to speak. Begins with a question. Okay, this is three stanzas. <clears throat> Begins with a question. Had we but world enough in time, well, take that back, not a question, a condition. Had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. Okay? What's the condition? Had we but means if we had. If we had world enough in time, that is, we could go anywhere on the world we wanted to, and we had all the time in the world, this coyness, this plain hard to get, would not be a crime. And the speaker's going to go on and explain, if we had all the world and all the time, here's what we would do. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass our long love's day. Maybe you never did this. I've got memories, more than one, of many a summer day when I was a little kid growing up in California with a friend or a sibling, you know, middle of July or August, hot as Hades, and what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? And you don't do anything the entire day long. That's what he's saying. We could do that our long love's day. Why is it long love's? Because there's no end to it. Because we have world enough and time. So, you by the Indian Ganges side, the Ganges River in India, would find rubies. And I, by the tide of umber, would complain. The Umber is a river in northern England. And when he says, I would complain, he doesn't mean I would sit there and moan to my fate. Complain is linked to the word complaint, which in this time period had more than just, you know, I'm going to write a argument uh, pointing out something bad. Not that kind of complaint. Complaint also meant a love song. So you have a, there's a poem called, I think it's Shakespeare, Lover's Complaint. And it's the lover expressing his frustration over not getting to fulfill his love, okay? So you gather rubies and I'd write love songs about you. I would love you 10 years before the flood. Why is the flood capitalized? What flood can you think of? that it might be bear reference to. Noah's flood. Book of Genesis, fifth or sixth chapter. So 10 years before that flood, I would love you. And you should, if you please, if you wanted to, because we have all the time in the world, you would refuse till the conversion of the Jews. When is the conversion of the Jews, according to traditional Protestant theology, at least? When Jesus returns. So 10 years before the flood to whenever in the future. He's saying, it's all cool. If we had all the world in time, that'd be fine. My vegetable love, all that word means, the vegetable, is slow growing. It would slowly build. He says, should grow faster than empires and more slow. 
A hundred years, and then he starts to catalog her beauty or to express some of it. This is kind of what's called a blazon. We'll talk about a blazon a little bit later. Blazon is a catalog, a mapping of the woman's beauties. Okay? So he says, A hundred years should go to praise thine eyes and on thy forehead day. So a hundred years for eyes and forehead. Two hundred to adore each breast. So that's two hundred times two, four hundred for her breasts. Obviously what? He likes her breasts more than he does her eyes and forehead. Okay? But 30,000 to the rest. What's the rest? Again, it's a map. Where's he started? Top of the map, moving down. 100, 400, 30,000. Tells you what his interest is in. Okay? An age at least to every part. What is an age? An age is a long period of time. The Elizabethan age was a period essentially from about 1558 to 1603. Okay? That's 50 some years, uh, 48 years. An age at least to every part. And the last age, oh, isn't this sweet, would show your heart. That's the most important part, he's saying. For lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. What does that word rate mean? Like when high school students, this has happened a couple of times, actually more than that, over the last 10 or 15 years, a bunch of high school male students get busted for rating the girls in their high school on some kind of social media thing, you know, 10, 9, whatever, one, kind of, but he says, nor would I love you at lower rate. That implies a different kind of rating. Possibly. No. If you have a student loan, you have a rate. That rate is the percentage rate you will pay back on that loan. Okay? That's what he's getting at. It's an economic term. It's a monetary term. He's saying, honey, you're worth at least a grand. What has just immediately happened? She has been turned totally into an object. She has been, well, it began here. <laughs> he began commodifying her here, okay? But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near. It's not the chariot that makes the noise. It's time on horseback. It's that horse getting closer and closer and closer and closer. Why is it at his back? Because he's facing the future. What's the future? It's a stupid question, right? But it's not really. The future is anything ahead of you time-wise. The next second. I don't literally know what I'm going to say five seconds from now. I've got an idea because I've done this a hundred times. Okay? That time is kind of pushing him forward. But at my back I always hear times Winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Why ahead of us? Why off in the future is it a desert? Most people, generally, when they think of, if they think at all, of quote unquote eternity, they have at least in the West, they have this vague notion, you know, reward, punishment, heaven, hell. Heaven's what? It's not a desert. I used to drive.
drive back and forth through the Mojave Desert and the deserts of the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, et cetera, okay? Do that during the summer, not fun, okay? Most people don't think of that as eternity. Why? There's no life there. Deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing song. Well, when is that? What is her marble vault? Where are we? We are that, that way. Highland Drive, go down like two blocks that way, get on the Highland Drive, take a right, and you're going to go by a city cemetery. There are a couple of vaults there. Not many. Vaults are those big brick marble buildings that are built for one reason, to put a casket or coffin inside above the ground. Usually paid for by someone who wants to say, look how big and powerful and important I was. You know, I'm not in the ground rotting with the worms. In thy marble vault, no more shall sound what? No more, no more shall be found what? My song. Why? Because we're going to be dead. And your remains are going to be in that vault rotting away for all eternity, the implication is. Then, then, in the distant future, okay, here comes the foul image. Then, Worms shall try that long preserved virginity, and your quaint honor turn to dust and into ashes all my lust. He's implying what? You don't sleep with me, she's gonna die what? A virgin. Pretty presumptuous on his part. It's like maybe she's looking at him and she's looking at Chris Hemsworth over here, you know, like. No, I'll take this one. That's not the disgusting image. What's the disgusting image? Worms shall try that long preserved virginity. What does the word try mean? Well, it can mean attempt. It means prove. Like a trial? How are they going to prove it? By going in and out and in and out. That, that is just disgusting, okay? And your quaint honor will turn to dust. Her honor is called quaint. What does quaint mean? It's fastidious, it's scrupulous, it's paying attention to the little fine details. He's saying, honey, your honor's not that important. He doesn't mean that literally. He means, you're not really going to lose your honor by sleeping with me. The implication is, who's going to know? Right? The grave's a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. And he's probably referencing a poem by an earlier 17th century poet named John Donne, who wrote a poem called The Relic. And The Relic is about someone digging up a grave and finding inside two bodies. You know, we talked about with Hamlet, grave, act five, the grave digger scene, they dig up these bodies because you have to make a new grave. Well, in the relic by Dunn, what the person digging the grave finds is a bone, like a wrist bone, and around that is a bracelet made of hair his lover's hair, a golden bracelet of hair, okay? Are they literally embracing? No, but they are embracing via that image. Now, therefore. The therefore, first stanza is premise one, second stanza is premise two. Here's the conclusion of the argument. While the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning Youthful hue, that's complexion. That's youthful beauty. While it sits on your skin like morning dew. How? 
What happens to the dew that you see on the grass early in the mornings? Sun comes up, what happens? It evaporates. What's going to happen to that youthful hue? It's going to evaporate. You're going to get old and wrinkled and ugly, and so to speak, supposedly. And so while it sits like that on you, and while your willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, what is he saying about her? I know you won't do it. It's her willing soul. Come on, you want this. You want this. Now let us sport us while we may. Let's have fun. Let's get busy. And now, like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chat power. What? what? Amorous birds of prey? What the hell is he talking about? Medieval Renaissance idea that the way birds of prey, eagles, falcons, kites, hawks, etc., mated was male and female bird would fly way up high, like six, ten thousand feet. The male would mount the female, and then they stopped flying. Drop like rocks. And she's going, hurry, 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 because they're getting closer and closer to the ground. That's what it means. Let us devour our time rather than what? Be slowly chewed up by time. How does time slowly chew you up? It's Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. I'm 62. I don't know what your ages are. I don't know if you saw me walking around in the hallway. I've been limping because my left knee, I'm having it replaced in, in a few months. Because every morning when I wake up, it hurts a little bit more and a little bit more. It is time slowly chewing me He's saying, no, 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 no. Let's make time work. How? In sex. I mean, that's his point. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. He's like, let's so entwine our bodies that we become one thing. Another poem by John Donne talks about male and female coming together and making one neutral Thing, neither he nor she. And let us tear our pleasures with rough strife. I once had a student write about this and went off into this weird sadomasochistic bondage. Yeah, I'm like, not what he's talking about. Tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. That through the iron gates of life, um, that's what's called the criticus locus. That is, it's a critical focal point. Nobody really knows what he's talking about. But what are the iron gates of life? Um, Book of Job talks about the gates of death. And the gates of death are not just one gate, but you go through one gate and then you keep going. It's a process rather than a... a, a Specific instant, through the iron gates of life, thus though we cannot make our sun stand still, biblical illusion, okay, book of Joshua, Joshua and his troops are going to capture the town of Ai, he prays, God stops time, he stops the sun, so they can destroy the inhabitants of, time, of Ai. We can't make our sun stand still, he says, but what can we do? Oh, we can make him run. What's the point? It's almost like he says, so let's hop into bed, okay? One thing about Carpe Diem, well, these two, at least. Can you really see some guy trying these? You know, you sidle up next to a girl in a bar and you go, hey, baby, what's going to happen? You're going to be lucky if you walk out of there, all right? It's not meant that way. These are meant to be extremely witty. 
That is, you're playing verbal games. You're trying to show, how can I use everyday normal words in such a way as to write this one beautiful poem, and two, have it mean a variety of things. Because some people will read the poem differently than I just did. They can't deny the carpe diem aspect and the sex aspect, but they won't go into the, I can guarantee you, nobody else in this department goes into the details that I do with, and I didn't even point out one word, which I will right now. I shouldn't, but what the hell. Your quaint honors turn into dust. I told you, you know, it has the one meaning, fastidious, scrupulous, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what's the thing that's being turned into dust? We're told her honor. What's her honor based on? Her virginity. This comes from a Middle English word, kinkta. You don't pronounce the U like qua, okay? Kinkta. In Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, in Miller's Tale, you have a beautiful young woman, blonde, named Allison. And you have a, uh, who's she married to? She's married to, I can't remember, an old guy. I think he's like 60 or 62. And she has a young lover, right? And there's this other guy who wants to be her lover. His name is, or he's called in the story, Hinda Nicholas. Hinda means handy, like a handyman. What's a handyman? Someone good with his hands. That's all kind of work with his hands. Not that kind of handy. We would say handsy, right? Why? Because we're told more than once in the poem that he's going around whenever he can with that young woman named Allison and grabbing her by the quinta. Just before the election in 2016, an audio tape came out of then candidate Trump, and the tape was from like 10 years earlier, talking about grabbing women by the modern English. What does this become? So this is the middle English this is 17th century. It still has all but one of the vowels. This is a k sound. That, vowel, that, and that. It's come. By that's honor, okay? No, I can guarantee you. Nobody in the English department does that. In fact, one of the textbooks I use used to use, never used it. And I've been teaching this for probably 10 years and it all of a sudden showed up in an edition, in a footnote. I don't know if it was because of my teaching it or whatever, but it's interesting anyways. Okay, so those are the two uh, Carpe Diem poems that we're gonna be doing. I don't think there's another one that we'll do. Go to page 692, the author to her book, this is Ann Bradstreet, first American poet, okay, 17th century. Her poems, her book of poetry, let me say, was, I should have looked at that because I use it for my next class. Um, her book of poetry, her, her manuscript, handwritten poems, were taken, I think it was by her brother in law, by her brother in law. He went back to England, published them, okay, and they were an instant success. She was called, Bradstreet was, um, like the 10th muse. There are nine muses in ancient Greek poetry, ancient Greek writing, all right? So the book comes back to the United States, or to the colonies, and she takes it, takes the book, takes her manuscripts, and is, has it published in the United States as the book called The Tenth Muse, okay? This is referencing that book. And it's all based upon a controlling or extended metaphor. The metaphor is her poems are like children. 
Well, what do good parents do with their children before they send them out of the house? They make sure they're properly dressed. They make sure they're properly fed. They make sure they're properly taught, things like that. She's using all those ideas throughout this poem to talk about her poems. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view. Ill-formed offspring. How would you like if your parent called you, you ill-formed offspring of my... What, what's her point? How many of you have had to write a paper for a class and you knew it wasn't very good? But you had a deadline and you, yeah, we, everybody, you know, graduate school. <laughs> um, that's your point. But it was snatched. It, the book of poems, was snatched from thence by friends, brother-in-law, less wise than true. He was true. He thought, man, this is great. He thought he would be honoring her by doing this, but it wasn't a wise move. Why? Because she's going to say in the next four lines, they weren't ready for public viewing. So when she says, thou ill born offering of my feeble brain, who after birth did by my side remain, by using that phrase, after birth, she's implying that the poems were like the afterbirth after giving birth, the delivery of the placenta and everything, all right? Made thee in rags, that is, the ill-formed, the friends, excuse me, the friends, by exposing them, made thee in rags, halting to the press to trudge. Rags is probably talking about the kind of paper these were written on. See, this is written on cotton paper. Paper in the 17th century, cotton being used, uh, this is written on wood, sorry, wood pulp paper. Paper in the 17th century was based primarily on cotton or linen at the time. Wood pulp doesn't become popular uh, method for making paper until the 19th century and 20th. So in rags, Halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. Rags also appears to the appearance of the poems. She's saying, I didn't polish them. They weren't properly dressed. Errors were not lessened, all may judge. That's an allusion to the process of printing in Bradstreet's day. Right? The manuscripts that the friend took to a printer were handwritten. If you got handwritten stuff back in my, my Shakespeare course, they had to do a couple of essay exams. And the first one, I don't know what was going on with my head. It was like I was not writing like I normally do. Like I had a stroke or something. I couldn't read half of it. And they're like, what does this say? Imagine taking that and you're supposed to set it in type. Well, that's what happened lots of times in the early days of the printing press. So you're reading something, you're not sure what it says, and so you have to infer what it says. Remember when we talked about solid and sullied with Hamlet? It's probably that kind of case. So where errors were lessened, were not lessened, all may judge. She's saying the text became even more corrupt. At thy return, that is when the printed book was bought, brought back from England, my blushing was not small. Why was she blushing? Pride? Embarrassment. My rambling brat in print should a mother call. Why? Because the title page says Anne Bradstreet. I cast thee by as one unfit for light. That is, she took the printed book now and threw it away. She hid it somewhere. Why, thy visage was so irksome in my sight. It's irksome, again, because she didn't polish the poems before they were published. Yet being mine own, at length affection would thy blemishes amend. 
That is, I'm going to clean up my kids. I'm going to wash their faces before I let them go back outside. I washed thy face, but more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. How many of you ever taking some stupid standardized test where you have to fill in the little bubbles, realize you filled in the wrong bubble, and you go to erase it, and it rips it. Okay? That's what she's talking about. She went to, so this time period, you don't erase. There aren't pencils. All you have is ink to write with. And the way you remove ink from a page is you get a knife and you very gently scrape it. It's much easier to rip the page doing that. I stretch thy joints to make thee even feet. She's talking about the meter of a line, the meter, the pattern of rhymed and un, uh, of accented and unaccented syllables. She's saying, I realized some of my lines, for example, only had seven um, accented or unaccented syllables when it, there should be eight. So the, the line was called defective. I had to fix it. What else? I stretch thy joints to make the even feet, yet still thou runst more hobbly than is me. That is, but I still couldn't fix it perfectly. She couldn't even try afterwards. She couldn't figure out how to get all the number of syllables she needed in a line or lines. And better dressed to trim thee was my mind. I wanted to get you prepared for public viewing, but not save homespun cloth in the house I find. What's homespun cloth? You have one of your kids shear the sheep. You teach another one to spin the wool into thread, usually a woman, daughter, okay? And you make clothing from that. In other words, it's not what you go and buy from Nordstrom's or Saks Fifth Avenue. It's not really fine taffeta or silk or satin. It's rough. It's itchy. She's saying, the only stuff I could find in my house to attire you in are everyday, common, ordinary things. Well, what would a housewife in the mid-1600s have to write about? Just take a wild guess. Family, husband, children, house, day-to-day -day activities, family prayers, going to church. She lived in New England, so family prayers. Her house burns down, she writes about that. One of her kids dies, she writes about that. She writes about the day-to-day -day activities. That's the homespun material that she's talking about. She's not writing about kings and queens and princesses and great long off battles. In this array, amongst vulgars, mayst thou roam. That is, this material, amongst vulgars, that's us. Why? Because we're not privy to her day-to-day -day life and activities. In this array, amongst vulgars, mayst thou roam, in critics' hands beware thou dost not come. Don't fall into the hands of a literary critic. Why? Because they're going to rip it apart. <laughs> they're going to say, this isn't any good. Take thy way where yet thou art not known. She's not talking England. She's talking here. See, the book wasn't sold here. Her friend brought back a copy of the first printed or published book. And now she's taking it and she's revising it. She's correcting it so that it can be sold in the United States. And if for thy father ask, say thou hadst none. She's saying, the book of poetry is like Venus, born straight from the mind of Zeus. And for thy mother, she's poor, which caused her thus to send thee out of door. Why did she send her kids out to work? Why did parents, 100 years ago, send their children 
to work in factories to help bring in income. She's gonna make some bucks from selling the book, okay? Go from there to, we don't have time to do all of it, but we'll start it, 704. John Dunn, this is the poet I mentioned before, a valediction forbidding mourning. Every one of you, if you went to a public school or a private school, work home school, uh, when you graduated high school, there was a valedictorian at that high school. Maybe more than one, which to my mind is utterly ridiculous. The valedictorian is supposed to be the very best student. You can't have 20 very best students. You got to choose one. When one of my kids graduated, I'm not kidding, there were like 25. This is from Blackman High School. It's like, really? Because every last one gave the valedictory address. Makes graduation go from a relatively not totally time consuming to eating the day away. A valediction is what? It's a saying goodbye. Vale means goodbye, diction, word, saying. So a valedictory address is when someone stands up and says, you're getting ready to go out into the world. Here's my words of advice. This one is forbidding mourning. Why? Brief story behind the story, or behind the poem. According to Dunn's first biographer, a guy named Isaac Bolton, <clears throat> at this point in his life, Dunn was working as a private secretary for a famous man, and the guy was getting ready to travel to Europe from England. Dunn was going to go with him. He handled all of his correspondence. Dunn was regarded as the most brilliant man of his age, but he couldn't get gainful employment because King James didn't want him to. King James wanted him to be a priest, an Anglican priest, and Dunn didn't want to. So he's working this guy for this guy named Sir Robert Drury. So they're getting ready to go to Europe. And according to Walton, Dunn's wife had a premonition that while he was in Europe, she was going to deliver her child that she was carrying stillborn. And she told him and said, don't go. He went. She did deliver a stillborn child, okay? So this is a poem, if, if we take that biographical information, from a man to his wife who's saying, don't go, saying, I have to go, don't mourn, don't cry, okay? That's one way of reading it. It's possible it has nothing to do with that background information. I think actually the language of the poem implies it might be early before that child was delivered dead. As virtuous men, actually, we, we're at 853. We're not going to start it. Um, so we'll start this on Friday. We're way behind, so we've got to try to catch up a bunch. Um, so we'll do this. We'll try to just get as many done as we can on Friday. Um, I'm going to put a quiz up Friday. It'll be over the two videos on Monday, stuff today, and whatever we do on Friday. Be the first of what should be three quizzes over poetry. All right, have a good day. Sorry if I offended anybody. <laughs>